these seven scholars, they're scholars now, um, have done uh, this year. They, as you know, they chose to do this extra project. Um, it really is living our mission to create a um, creative, independent thinkers. Um, and I'm really proud of all of you. I want to congratulate all of you. We're really looking forward to hearing, hearing about your research. So thank you so much and congratulations.
adult education resources for the Monterey uh, County Department of Education. And it was shocking to me to see that now, and especially in this area that has such a large um, Latin American community, that these resources were already, already available in Spanish. Uh, so that kind of, in relation to my studies, gave me the perspective or the view to really consider language and how we relate to that and how we do that in our day-to-day -day lives. I also got the opportunity to travel to Berlin and um, my host siblings there, who were 10 and 9 years old, spoke perfect English. Um, and that was another cultural shock for me because here we are start learning to start learning English to high school. And once we do, there is really a need to know it because everything for us here is English. Um, so they had, they knew German, they knew English, and they were getting ready to learn their language, and they were choosing between French and Spanish. Um, and they would ask me, you know, questions, like, oh, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite book? I really like Harry Potter. Coincidentally, my host brother, Frederick, also likes Harry Potter, so after dinner, he invited me to watch it with him, and I assumed we'd watch it in English, but, or sorry, I assumed we watched it in German, but he put it on in English for me, so that I could also understand. And I asked him why he did this, and he said so that we can both understand what is being said. And that was just a very profound moment for me, again, considering our attitude towards language in the U.S. and when we start to explore cultures outside of our own. I lived in America, but everything I was exposed to um, 
was almost entirely Russian. I spoke Russian until I started school primarily at home. I watched Russian cartoons. I um, spoke Russian, like I said before. I went to uh, traditional Russian church and stuff like that. And it was interesting experiencing this disconnect with everybody else when it came to traditional um, American pop culture and stuff like that. And although at first it was a little bit isolating, exploring it further, especially in high school, and realizing the importance of knowing more than one language, being exposed to more than one culture, um, became very important to me, um, especially as I started exploring the third language, French, and I went and studied abroad in France, and I saw the potential that I had um, with all of these three languages, all of these three cultures. And my project was mostly to show and expose other people to the importance of learning another language, or another two or three languages. And finding the beauty in um, taking all of these different perspectives, cultures, languages, and using it to create this global vision where you are able to see and understand so many different people, which I believe is important in an entire, in an increasingly more globalized um, world. So that was, yeah, that was my story. <laughs>
formal language learning class. Uh, I picked up a bit of it because it's spoken at home, but you know, my only real option was Duolingo, which is not really uh, a replacement for a proper Spanish class. So when I got to high school and I started in Spanish one, um, it was like an opening of a whole new world for me. It wasn't just um, the opening of a language, but it was the opening of an entirely different culture, something I had never done or explored before. And throughout the years, um, as I learned more and more of the language, I learned more and more of the culture, and I was able to go on um, a foreign exchange program trip to Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I learned more of the culture and the language. But when I was there, um, one thing I noticed was the extremely cheap prices of everything, which was incredibly <laughs> surprising. But I decided to look more into this, and they are in the middle of an extreme economic crisis. Um, my time there alone, uh, I was there for a month about, and the exchange rate went from 120 or 15 pesos to the dollar to 140, which is just absolutely insane. I'll talk more about the inflation rates and just how bad everything is and put into scale later. But I decided to do my project just on looking into this um, this crisis they're having and how the citizens have responded. And basically, they, res they responded by um, uh, creating this kind of underground black market uh, for American currency, which was really interesting to look into and explore. And that's my uh, synthesis project. <laughs> to social justice course at York. So first of all, I want to define um, my definition of social justice, and that would be the principles of equality and equity for everyone. And I think that understanding social justice means recognizing that society is divided and unequal among social groups, and a social group, for example, would be race, class, gender, um, and more. Um, and I think practicing social justice would mean recognizing these inequities and working, actively working to change them. So I wanted to first talk about my experience. So I actually took an introduction to social justice course at our local community college, um, Modern and Midfield College. And it was in the summer after my freshman year. So right in the middle of COVID, didn't really have much to do over the summer, and I'm really passionate about social justice, so I thought, you know, why not? And it really opened my eyes to the way that I view society. Um, it's really just important to develop those like critical thinking skills and really analyzing and discussing like what is the place that we live in, what is the society that we live in. So, for my ideas for this um, curriculum myself, is that I would like to start with the basic foundation of key concepts and terminology regarding social justice. And for example, some of these terms would be such as like culture, socialization, prejudice, discrimination, oppression, intersectionality. Um, and after students get like this basic foundation of concepts. I would hope to go into local social movements in the US, um, but something that I didn't get in my Intro to Social Justice course at FBC was a global, a push to a global significance. I think it's really important to look outside our own country and at um, other countries, other places in the world as well regarding social justice. Um, so I hope that this I plan for this class to do that. And I really want it to be multidisciplinary. Um, I want to combine English, history, philosophy, culture, language, art, music, and even statistics and research and math. Um, and I really want students to pursue their own passions within social justice 
and I hope to tie it into service learning somehow as well. So that's a basic overview of my Global Scholars project for this year. slash art slash maybe even English elective at York School. Um, so when you kind of think of a famous artist, who's the first person that comes to mind? Are they a man? Are they a white man? Are they a European man? <laughs> and how, what century were they actually alive in? Because from where I sit, those are the people that I know the most about, um, not really what's going on in the so I had the opportunity to study in Paris two summers ago, and there I really dipped my toes into like exploring art. And as I talk about in our podcast episode, I visited um, Paris's, or actually the French National Museum of Immigration, and I saw this really fascinating exhibit about um, the African diaspora and generational knowledge and how we pass that down and continue it and became really interested in this idea of art history but not necessarily taught in a eurocentric lens so that being said though i think that this idea of art for art's sake um there's a quote that again i mentioned but it's essentially how most asian artists they never made art just to make art there was always a greater like social significance behind it um, and some form of resistance. So I want to use art within this course as the catalyst to explore complex social issues. Um, looking at America, if you think of our AIDS crisis, you might think of the Names Project Memorial Quilt, which was laid on the National Mall and Keith Haring. And um, even just yesterday in our English class, we're talking, we're reading Maxine Hong Kingston and we're seeing how um, she writes about her Chinese American experience growing up, first gen in the US um, as a woman, and how she explores her identity through a different art form. Um, so again, I just really want to approach art almost as its own history class, but not one centered in the past, but rather the present, and kind of looking forward and seeing how we can continue to learn from what's happening around us and actually partake in it. Thank you to everyone for sharing. Um, this is really inspiring and to so continue the dialogue and learning through the dialogue. Um, it's our hope that we can now open to you. We're going to have a moderated panel discussion round. We have a series of questions that were constructed by our local scholars, um, fairly curated by us, um, just in terms of time, we really want to invite the audience, all of you, friends, family, faculty, um, to participate in question and answer, and offer some of your insight and ask them more about what they can share. Um, so we're going to get started, the format is I'm going to start with the first four questions and then my colleague is going to continue with the last three. Um, so please listen up and if you have any paper or just a number of questions, um, we're ready to participate as they share their responses and we can ask them. So to start, I will begin with a question for Annie. Um, and this connects what, what Kieran and Karia and Maddie of this book talked about. Um, so we have Annie, what got you interested in social justice? When did that begin for you? Was there a catalyst? Um, I think it started really early for me. Um, it started with my mom teaching me um, 
to look at injustices within society and to speak out and to try to change how things are. Um, started very, very young just from her saying, you know, some people, some people discriminate against other people just because they're an aspect of their identity. Um, and when I got into high school, I really um, found my little niche in social justice. My mom gave me books about criminal justice and mass incarceration, and I just found myself immersed. And so in the future, I hope to um, be a criminal justice lawyer. Um, I'm going to school and I'm learning um, ethnic studies in the next coming four years. So I'm really excited for my future. So. <laughs> Her youngest, or her second youngest, um, 
to come get us for dinner. And she said, tell them in English. And he come, came in, knocked on my door, and I opened it, and he just stood there looking at me for a second. And I could have forgotten the phrase, dinner's ready. And he just kind of pointed to the kitchen, I'm like, is dinner ready? He goes, yeah. <laughs> Um, a term that you hear a lot 
or at least I did in my research, is decolonizing the arts. Um, and the Nordic Art Review defined this as reviewing the canon and questioning the ability to include different voices and perspectives. And I think we need to recognize that within the art world, there are a lot of different hierarchies um, that maintain power just as they exist in the world around us with their education system, criminal justice system, whatever it may be. Um, so really the goal is for students to, again, understand art as the catalyst to explore complex social issues. Um, and part of that might mean learning about different art all over the world and how specific movements have impacted, um, have impacted various different artists. On the other side of the coin, it might also mean um, really giving space for students to explore issues that they're passionate about. Um, and personally, I'm, environmental justice has really have been a main focus in my life, and I intend to do environmental studies and studio art um, next year. So just kind of thinking about how I can make those connections and how I can link art in a meaningful way, um, whether that be something that I paint or that is like carved on print or even a piece of writing. Um, and just making that space for each and every student involved to also have their own sort of mini exploration and connect to the greater global um, realm of things. So I described what I hope for my course a little bit in my introduction. So I'm going to go into more um, learning objectives that I hope students gain from an introduction to social justice course. Um, before I took um, the introduction to social justice course at FPC, I thought I knew a lot about society and justice, and you know, I thought like, oh, I'll be learning a bit, but it's not going to be super new to me. And it was very new to me. Um, it really, this course will help students not only analyze, um, but observe the mechanics of society. And I think it's so important to know the mechanics of what we live in, like how everything operates. And I think that is so important and it really opened my eyes. Um, and as for another learning objective, I really like students to take away critical thinking skills, how to analyze, observe, discuss um, our society in the way that injustices permeate through different systems. So. Thank you. Um, the idea of the catalyst, I love or art as a catalyst, and then segue into language as a catalyst. I remember the bumper sticker that I used to have that said monolingualism can be cured. And to that end, I think the single story perspective, right, the need for perspective can also be cured. So there's no one single story. And that segues for the question to now Adriana. Um, so, you know, thinking of being fluent in multiple languages and how this can shift, um, lead to a shift in one's cultural identity. Um, like other scholars, you've experienced living in a multilingual family. For you, what role does language play in your identity? Uh, you can think of cultural identity or any type of identity as you define. I think what it does is it gives me the opportunity to expand my understanding of things, which I believe being able to understand something is one of the most important things to me in general. Um, and be, knowing more than one language gives me the opportunity to understand something that someone else could already tell me in that language. You can learn about other cultures um, from English textbooks and stuff like that, in history class and stuff like that. But that doesn't quite cover or doesn't quite express exactly what it is about that culture that is so amazing, the same way that you would learn it in that language. There is a term called lost in translation that I think that is incredibly real. I see it like um, trying to even just like call words or phrases between Russian and English or English and French um, or 
any way like that, it, um, there's always this like moment of like, does this really get the meaning across? Does, and it's like oftentimes there will be one Russian word that I'm thinking of and I'm trying to think of an English equivalent and I can't think of anything. Nothing kind of expresses the same intensity of um, that word and that language. And I believe learning other languages, broadening your um, perspective, gives you understanding, and understanding leads to um, expanding your identity even. Um, like I was mentioned in my introduction, there's like this interesting sort of third space between cultures, because I don't fully identify with either fully Western culture or fully Russian culture. And now I can fill that third space with what I learned from other cultures, and it's just my own little mush pot somewhere in the middle.
other people's cultures and look at them on your own. Because the one thing is crucial to understanding other people around you and making more connections. But it's also like a way to, I guess, if you learn more cultures, then you can make a more creative solution and become more ideas and that whole it's just a better way to understand the community around you. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up was a TED Talk, I don't know if you guys have all watched it. I always forget the name of the person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the name of the TED, of the TED Talk is The Danger of a Single Story. And I've watched it like three years in a row. But um, <laughs> I think it's, she brings up something interesting about the point because oftentimes we're stuck in this like one perspective of things. Like if we don't know other cultures or we're trying to learn, and then that sort of ignorance is built up that we might not be aware of. So she was referring to the Western media and how she was going to be subjected to characters with blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, so she wasn't aware of like um, main characters being able to be characters that look different or more like herself.
children understand that other people who have not grown up in the same way we have and who have not had the same experience as other people. <clears throat>
can stand, feel free to stand, shake it out if you want. Um, we can start with um, our colleague, Dr. Gerstel. Yes. Uh, thank you all. Um, I've only had the pleasure of working alongside Maya, um, but I want to ask everybody this question because I'm passionate about deconstructing singular approaches and singular perspectives. And um, I'm curious, apart from just exposure to the youth, right, um, could you impart some of your wisdom to me and give me some advice on how to do that here at York? Um, and um, and I think like exposure is really important, but how you expose people to multiple perspectives is really uh, a tricky, tricky game sometimes. So um, if you could impart some wisdom, I'd really appreciate it. So the question was uh, an invitation to impart this History was supposedly written. No, history was written from the supposedly neutral position of objectivity and universality, which is, in fact, was neither universal nor objective. And I think that at least something that I've seen in the last year as the history curriculum has changed, particularly for US women, I was in the course to now. I think that that's something that we're beginning to understand a little bit more. And really dig deeper and unpack a lot of the societal issues that we don't necessarily want to talk about in the classroom. And there is an appropriate way to do that. And then you think government we repeat this idea of debate ideas, not people, or groups of people. And I think that, again, just we need to have the tough conversations at a relatively young age and we need to have the, um, this capacity for like nuance and really to learn and influence our views, um, but at the same time, like a really important aspect of things is ensuring that we're teaching in a safe space where all students um, feel comfortable and you know teachers are just really cognizant of the ways that discussions might impact various people. Yeah. Um, I think another way to bring awareness or cultural awareness on campus would be to sort of absorb and encourage the way in which um, children might experience their own culture. So I'm, I'm talking uh, based on the uh, Spanish, they can't read Spanish, they can't write Spanish. 
finish. Uh, so he was talking about the gifting of your class instead of books, of poetry books. Um, and on one page, it was in like Spanish, and it was translated to English. And she was not allowed to read the kids the poem in Spanish. So just kind of working, I guess, with, with kids in that way. And we don't really have um, English as second language learners here, but just taking that approach and finding other ways to work with culture instead of against it and trying to make everything a single um, perspective. Thank you. Um, if I can add one more thing, I would say that your student body is definitely diverse in a lot of different ways, like culturally, racially, um, in terms of like sexuality, um, class, whatever it may be, and we don't always see that with um, the teachers around us. Um, so I think that, again, just being really like, considerate of how we build the faculty, especially in years of really a lot of change and a lot of turnover, um, and also bringing in um, various community members and connecting people to the classroom. I know World Religions has done a lot of like field trips, but they come to York type things. Um, <laughs> That's also really valuable. Thank you. Um, all of your comments remind me of um, when the grads were at the moment and cultural responsibility, teaching and learning, but um, creating those spaces. And I'm also thinking of our international students um, who go through Cambridge and to our veteran speakers. Um, I do think you know we have we have a lot here and to find a way things be bicultural, bilingual, multicultural, and to bring in those, in those observations is, is crucial. Um, thank you for your wisdom and courage to share um, a question. And in the spirit of inquiry, of wanting to dig deeper, um, any other audience members? Yes. Hi, um, I remember all the time ago Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned. 
Um, you mentioned that in your course you really wanted it to be multidisciplinary. Um, but I'm curious what you think, why that's so valuable, and what that brings to a course more than just, you know, kind of like a standard history of your course. So the question is, um, can you repeat that question? Um, yeah, like, why she thinks it's so valuable to um, have that course be multidisciplinary um, and include a lot of other types of forms of learning. Why do you think your course um, should be multidisciplinary? Okay, well, um, with my encounters, like academically um, with social justice, it's been very English and history based. Um, but through that course at BC I took, I realized that social justice is everywhere. Inequities are everywhere, and one might think that social justice doesn't impact subjects such as math or science, but when we live in society, it impacts everything. Um, and so I think it's really important to embrace that social justice and the mechanics of society really impact everything, and to bring different um, disciplines into that learning is really important to me. Um, and having the 
culture clubs and then teachers who speak other languages or have been exposed to other languages or other cultures to like pass it off to the students and then be able to Going back to the, the media thing that I was talking about earlier, just seeing the short of actually traveling to a different country, um, seeing the experiences of that country's people uh, is one of the most things I think we can immerse ourselves and also looking into our communities and looking at the ethnic groups within them. In Salinas, there's a big Mexican American, Latin American community as well, culture that you can see from that with the stories that we have. And, um, I know that I said earlier that it was very common for films to show in other languages, but in our theater on our own side, um, a lot of the kids in movies, especially, are showing them Spanish, and so they felt like the same showings for that. Um, so, yeah, just kind of being able to recognize the diversity within our communities and um, also diversifying the new media we have access to. So that's just kind of an interesting like, thing to consider. And I wish I had the stats in front of me, but I applied for like, an advocacy thing a couple of years ago. And I realized that Marina is like, one of the most diverse communities in California. And I've lived there my entire life. And um, predominantly immigrants, um, just so many different cultures. And you can see it just in um, all the different like community activities that are hosted and everything like that. So again, just like being aware of that. And I think I've taken it for granted. Like Marina is where I grew up. Grew up. Marina is where I go grocery shopping, but it's not the same as when I was a family um, in suburban Ohio. It's obviously different in a lot of ways. And I think just like, Grasping that you're in a bubble, but also sometimes that like, the community that you're already in is really incredible as well. Thank you. Um, let's give um, everyone a round of applause.
market, um, underground, blue market, black market, um, and at different rates. Um, also, we can talk about the season. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 